Um, in case you've not been with us or have forgotten and uh, Christmas sort of sapped your memory, let me bring us up to speed on where we've been. In Jerusalem in AD 30, Jesus dies on the cross, and on the third day, he's raised again from the dead. Then he ascends into heaven shortly after that. Fifty days after his resurrection, the Holy Spirit falls on, uh, comes at Pentecost in Jerusalem and falls on the first uh, uh, Christians. There were about 120 Christians on the planet at this time in an upper room waiting and gathering. The Holy Spirit comes and falls on them, and the apostles, the, those closest to Christ, begin to speak in other languages, other tongues, other earthly languages, the wonders of God. This draws a crowd. Peter is filled with the Spirit, gives the first sermon in church history history, and 3,000 souls are converted to Christ that day. Not bad for a first sermon. This growing group of Christians then gathers together in their homes in Jerusalem and on the back steps of the temple, and they are kind of characterized by radical generosity to each other, by prayer, um, by kindness and compassion in the community, and by devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching about Jesus. Uh, then Peter and John, on the way to the temple one afternoon, see a man crippled since birth, and they heal him in Jesus' name. This again draws a crowd. Peter seizes the moment, filled with the Spirit, gives the second great sermon in church history, and 5,000 people are converted that day. But Peter and John are dragged off uh, to jail and warned not to preach anymore in this name of Jesus by the Sanhedrin. And Peter and John pretty much say, uh, too bad, we're not going to stop. That's my translation, but they say essentially that. And the church continues to grow. Uh, but as it grows, it also faces opposition. So you have this exploding church with internal struggles with some corruption and some deceit. Uh, and you also have external opposition forces trying to stop this movement. In AD 32, a man named Stephen gives a powerful speech, a sermon that he connects the Old Testament history of the prophets and the law to uh, Jesus as the true Messiah and the king, long awaited for king. And many people are moved in, in their hearts. But he is also uh, enrages the religious leaders. They stir up the crowds, and he's stoned to death. His death um, makes him the first Christian martyr, and it sparks an outbreak of persecution. Now the heat really gets turned up, and this church that's only in Jerusalem, which is exploding, now is under intense persecution. The persecution causes many of the believers to scatter all over the, the, the area, some going to Samaria and some going to other parts of the Roman world. Uh, for the sake of the gospel. But even as they spread, the gospel gets preached, people are one to Christ, and the church continues to grow. Uh, and that's where we pick up the story here in Acts chapter 8. Last week, I think you heard, I think it was Sterling actually talked to talk you about the conversion of the Apostle Paul. Uh, we're going to go back up a little bit. In Acts chapter 8, this, this, the scattering happens early in Acts chapter 8. And some of the places they end up getting scattered to are in Samaria, the last place a faithful Jew would ever think to go. But that's where they go. They preach the word of God. And they see really what, what amounts to a revival, the whole city full of joy. Many people that are healed physically and spiritually coming to Christ, really sort of a miraculous thing going on in the region of Samaria. And that's where a man named Philip ends up uh, being a, a central figure in that revival in Samaria. We first hear about Philip earlier in Acts 6 when he's selected to be one of the uh, seven men to help the distribution of food to widows. He's sort of a deacon or a servant in the church. Now he's a missionary to Samaria, of all things. Let's pick up the story in Philip's story in this amazing encounter in Acts 28, verses 26 through 40. If you have your Bible, you can follow along with me or your Acts journal or on the screens. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place, and he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join his chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah, the prophet, and asked, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter. Like a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And the eunuch said to Philip, about whom, I ask you, is, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? And, and he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. 
And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Really uh, an astounding story. One of those stories you read that you think, it almost sounds like, really, that, that happened? It just sounds like almost otherworldly, what's going on there. Now, Philip, as I said, has been a key leader in Samaria. So let's put this in perspective. He's in Jerusalem, one of the early converts, one of the early leaders in the church. Persecution is so intense, he has to flee for his life. His flight, though, ends up being part of God's divine plan. He ends up in Samaria, preaching the gospel there, and people are getting converted. He's at the center of a miraculous thing happening. And right at that moment, when the whole city of Samaria is full of joy and people are coming to Christ left and right, an angel shows up and tells him to leave. Right at the moment when things are really going well, an angel shows up and says, I want you to go south. Now, there have been a few times in my life when I've really wanted God to show up and tell me what to do. How have you ever felt like, I'm not sure what decision to make, I'm not sure what direction to go? If God would just make it clear, if he would just write it in the sky, send an angel, just make it so I had no doubt I'd feel better about my situation. Anybody ever feel that way? Well, let me ask this. What if God does that? He shows up with an angel, but what he says to you makes no sense at all. God does show up and tell you directly what to do, but it's not anything you would expect. I'm sure, Philip, the last thing he thinks is, Go south of Jerusalem. He's in Samaria, which is north of Jerusalem. He's going to the desert road south on the way to Gaza. That's at least a 50-mile journey on foot. To the middle of nowhere. To the desert road. Matter of fact, let's see a picture of, the, I think, the road here on the screen. That's that road today. Think of it in the first century A.D. Quite literally, the middle of nowhere. I want you to go on foot 50 miles south to the middle of nowhere. Why, God? I'm in the middle of doing amazing things for you. People are, are listening to your word preached, and you're using me. Why would you take me out of here? Why would you send me to the middle of nowhere? It made no sense to him from a human perspective. Why, what in the world is God up to? You ever ask that question? But it's interesting, and I think important for us to notice, that Philip is not told Why? God does not show up and say, all right, let me explain it to you in rational terms, what I'm up to. He doesn't give him any more than just the command, I want you to leave. I want you to go. And I think very often in our lives, God does not tell us step two until we've taken step one. He does not explain to us the next step until we've acted in obedience in the first step. We wish he would. I know I do. We would love to limit God's will to the measure of our understanding of what he ought to do. But praise him that he doesn't do that. It's not the way he operates. Because the gospel opens doors. If we're willing to walk through them. It's important to notice that Philip must obey before he understands. That's a part of how it works, friends. We must, and, and Matt said that even, right? I have all these questions. I don't understand. But then I realized maybe I already, I already do believe in Jesus, but I have questions. We must obey before we fully understand. Christianity was born into a culture that was just as opposed to it and hostile to it, if not more, than our own culture today. Yet we see this radical spread of the message to individuals, stories of transformation. Here in Acts 8, we have the, an Ethiopian conversion, an African conversion. In Acts chapter 9, last week, you heard about the Jewish rabbinic conversion from Saul to Paul. In Acts 10, next week, you're going to hear about the European conversions that happened. I mean, the gospel is spreading throughout the Roman world. Just consider some of the details here that make this story remarkable. Verse 26, an angel tells Philip to go south the desert road. Verse 29, the spirit tells Philip to go up to the chariot and stay near it or join it. Verse 30, Philip ran up to the chariot. Now the English translations don't always capture exactly what's going on here. The reason Philip was told to join or go stay near the chariot, and the reason that he ran is because the chariot is moving. So what we have going on here is this. Hey, what you doing? I see you're reading your Bible. Need any help with that? You know, and that's like, that's what's going on here. He's running alongside the chariot, having this conversation. Um, imagine... It, it, you're on this 50-mile journey south. 
There's a chariot running, going down the road. God goes, go up. He doesn't tell him why. He doesn't tell him what. He just says, I want you to go near that chariot. Uh, but God, it's, it's moving. Yeah, run. So he catches up to the chariot. He's running alongside it. What do we know about this Ethiopian now? What do we know about this guy? Well, uh, he's an important government official. We're told that he was in charge of all the treasury of the queen of Ethiopia, Candace, at that time. It, it amounts to like the CFO of the country, of the nation. He's a high-ranking official. He's in charge of the royal treasury. He's wealthy. He owns a chariot, and he's reading a scroll, which he possesses, which means he's wealthy and he's educated. He's reading a Hebrew scroll in an African chariot on his way home from Jerusalem. He's religious. He's a spiritual seeker. Matt said that about himself, didn't he? I was a seeker, a searcher. He has come to Jerusalem, verse 27, why? To worship at the temple, seeking this God he's heard about. I don't know if we can fully appreciate the radical nature of what's going on here. The gospel breaks down, it opens doors and it breaks down barriers. That's the second point. I, I, this story is, um, the radical nature of this encounter I think escapes us sometimes. So, uh, so think about it this way. In this corner, you have a sexually altered African pagan uh, man from the f f far reaches of the Roman Empire. Ethiopia in the ancient world was uh, it encompassed part of Somalia, Eritrea, uh, and Nubia. Uh, is, is, today it's a whole vast region, basically all of Northeast Africa in the ancient world. So you have the sexually altered black African pagan man from the far edges of the Roman Empire. In this corner, you have a middle-class, middle-aged, Torah-observant, faithful Jew who now follows Jesus. These two men would never, never in a thousand years meet let alone have an encounter, if not for God's divine intervention, if not for the power of the gospel. It shouldn't surprise us that God has to show up and say, leave, and run up to that chariot, because it's not going to happen otherwise. This encounter is not going to happen without God directing it and his people obeying. It would never take place. God is always working to break down barriers. Always. Always. The gospel breaks down barriers. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, he says, You who were once far away have been brought near, because God, by his son Jesus, has destroyed the dividing wall of hostility, broken down the barrier, in other words, and brought you in. Now, Philip had just experienced this very thing in Samaria, hadn't he? Left Jerusalem, where he thought the church was supposed to be, ends up in Samaria. Jews didn't, Samaritans didn't hang out. And he sees the gospel working there, so maybe... He's drawing on past experience of God's faithfulness to say, okay, I don't understand what you're up to, but I'll go. I'll follow. The point I think here for us is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is not for any one race or culture more than any other. It is not the exclusive possession of any race or group. And I think we hear the opposite in our culture and our media today, don't we? Things like, you know, every culture has its own religion. Don't push yours on anyone else. You know, you, you Western white people of affluence and privilege, Christianity, Christendom, that's your religion, fine. Believe what you want to believe. But every other culture has their own, and they're all equally valid. Contrary to the critics in our culture, Christianity is not the sole possession or the sole product of white Western privilege. It has never been. Yale professor Laman Sane, uh, who is professor of religious history in Yale, uh, wrote a book called Whose Religion is Christianity? Small little book, very accessible, get it on Amazon, great read. He makes the case that Christianity is unique in, 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 among all the world's religions for this one major reason, many reasons, but one in particular. He says, all other major world religions still have their population centers in or near the region of the world in which they began. Most Muslims in the world still live in or near uh, Middle East and Indonesia. Most uh, Jews in the world still live in or near Eastern Europe, Middle East, in that area. Most uh, Hindus in the world and Buddhists in the world, so, so on and so forth, still have their population concentration, their largest concentration, in or near. They're regional, in other words. He says Christianity is not, and he gives lots of statistics to back this up. Here's what he writes about this. Almost certainly... Christianity, from its very outset, displayed much more cultural diversity than any other world religion, and it does so still today, and that must say something very important about it. I hope that encourages you. We hear the opposite in our culture today, that, you know, you Christians, it's your own, you Western Christians, you're pushing on other people, that's your own concoction. Don't, 
Christianity from its outset has been a global religion, not belonging to any one race or group. In the first century, Africans are converted, Europeans are converted, uh, faithful uh, you know, religious zealot Jews are converted. And even today, the population, despite what we think, is not, the center of Christendom is not America. It started in Jerusalem with converted Jews, but quickly spreads throughout the globe. Okay, back to this Ethiopian for a minute and his encounter with Philip. In verse 31, as Philip's running alongside the chariot, turn in verse 31 there, he invites him to come up and sit with him in the chariot. This was as radical for him as it would have been for Philip to get in. Have you ever wondered what this guy was doing in Jerusalem? If he's the CFO of Ethiopia, second-ranking official to Candace the Queen, why is he in Jerusalem? We get a little hint in verse 27. We're told in verse 27 of chapter 8. And he rose and went. There was Ethiopian a eunuch, a court official, who was in charge of all our treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning, seated in his chariot, reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, I'm in the realm of speculation here, when it, but I think we can make a few, uh, few, draw out a few implications about this guy. Number one, there to worship does not mean he, he's a, a true believer in Yahweh or a follower of Christ. It means he's seeking. Well, that's a, that's a, that phrase in Greek for worship just means spiritual seeking. He's not there to worship necessarily God, but he's heard about this God. And why would he come to Jerusalem to find out about this God of the Jews? Well, that's where the temple is, the physical presence of God on earth. He's come there to find out, to seeking something. He's reading Isaiah on the way home. Very likely he bought the Isaiah scroll while in Jerusalem, and it would have been very costly. Not like today where you have Bibles in your phones and Bibles in your homes and Bibles in your pockets. And to own a scroll would have been, you were, you were very, very wealthy. So he's searching for something. Think about that for just a minute. I want you to try to get inside this guy's life. This high-ranking, wealthy, educated, royal official had apparently made a very long and dangerous journey, over 800 miles from Ethiopia to Jerusalem, at great expense and great risk. Why? Seeking God. Seeking truth. Seeking something or someone. Now, do you know what would have happened to this guy when he finally got to the temple? Do you know, according to Old Testament Hebrew law, when he gets to the temple after his 800-mile journey seeking after God, what happens to him when he gets there? He would have been turned away. He would have been, by Jewish law, turned away. The text that he's reading is Isaiah 53. You can turn there and follow on the screens. Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. He's reading this text when Philip finds him. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that has led to the slaughter, and a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? That phrase, cut off, would have particular interest to a eunuch. If you don't know what a eunuch is, you can Google that later when you go home. Or maybe you shouldn't, actually. But he's reading this, and he hears about... Someone who's been cut off and cast out for the transgression of people. And he doesn't know who this is. Is the prophet talking about himself or someone else? And he can't make sense of it. On the same field of vision, or shortly after that part of the scroll, because the scroll, you don't flip pages, you roll out, right? On that same field of vision, flip in your Bibles a couple of chapters, so Isaiah 56, verses 3 through 5. The same prophet, the same part of the scroll, writes this. Let not the foreigner... Who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Let not the eunuch say, Behold, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbaths, who choose the things that please me and hold fast my covenant, I will give in my house and within my walls a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name. They shall not be cut off. This guy gets to Jerusalem, and according to Deuteronomy chapter 21, he, anyone that's been sexually altered or sexually mutilated cannot come into the temple of God. He's told, you can't come in. Sorry, you're not welcome here. 800 miles, he's turned away. He's on his way home. He's reading Isaiah, and he can't make sense of it. Think about this guy. He is a very wealthy and highly educated, high-ranking person in his country, yet he's paid a high price to get there, like nobody in our culture, of course. He's, he's paid a price. 
physically. In the ancient world, your wealth was ultimately measured not in riches, ultimately, but in descendants. And he can have none. There will be no sons to carry on his name. No daughters, no children or grandchildren. He's paid an ultimate price. And that was not unusual in the ancient world to make high-ranking court officials eunuchs. They would be therefore not a danger to the concubines or the women of the royal court. So he had that done to himself to get to that position. And he's missing something. And he goes in search of it. And he's told, you're not welcome here. And on the way home, he's reading this. And he can't make sense of it. And it's, so I, I think it's not a stretch to say, this is like the crossroads of the man's life, right? This is the moment of truth in his life, the spiritual dropping point, tipping point. And at that moment, with all this going on in his heart, being turned away, reading the scroll, at that moment, who comes running up? Think about it. How amazing is our God? that he cares about this lonely Ethiopian on his way home on a dusty desert road to send Philip 50 miles from the north, to, from Samaria, because he doesn't even know why, to find this guy who's confused and seeking him. At the moment, the critical moment of his life, Philip comes running up. How awesome is God? And says, hey, what you reading? Need any help with that? Right? And he says, what does he say? I can't make sense of it unless someone guides me. Why don't you hop in? I have a question. Who's he talking about? Do you know? Who's he talking about? And Philip says, essentially, I know exactly who he's talking about. In fact, I was sent here to tell you. His name is Jesus. Think about what was being promised him in, verse 50, in chapter 56. I will give in my house, within my walls, a monument and a name better than sons and daughters. An everlasting name that will never be cut off. Think of what that must have meant to this man. How can that happen? How can that... Does it have anything to do with this man who was cut off in chapter 53? And Philip says that's exactly what it has to do with. It has everything to do with him. He was cut off and cast out so that you could be brought in. And I was sent to this lonely, dusty road to tell you about it. That's Matt's story. That's my story. That's your story. That's our God. Lastly, the gospel must be shared. It opens doors if we're faithful and obedient enough to walk through them. It's always breaking down barriers, tearing down walls that get in our way from each other and from God. And it must be shared. He says, unless someone guides me, I will never... You see, the guy could reason his way, think his way, read his way only so far. He needed someone to tell him about Jesus. He needed to have it explained and shared. You may notice in your Bibles that um, verse 37 of Acts chapter 8 is missing. It's not a mistake by the translators. Um, it's a later insertion, most scholars believe. It gives like that Philip says you have to believe, and he says I do believe, sort of a qualification for baptism. Uh, the point is it's implied. The guy understands what Philip's talking about. He grasps who this Jesus is. And that's why when they see the water, he says, what prevents me? I believe in him. I trust him. What prevents me? And Philip says, stop, Right? Out they get. Here's the point as we finish up tonight. Spiritually speaking, we're all eunuchs. We are all cut off until Christ comes to find us. That's what the incarnation is. He comes into our lonely, dusty, middle-of-nowhere road, finds us where we are, offers us something we can hardly fathom at the cross. So we're all cut off until Christ brings us in. But once he brings us in, you know what he does? He sends you out. Once you've been brought into the family by his love and his grace, you are now the sent ones to go and share the message. It doesn't always happen like an angel showing up in the middle of the, what you can't understand what he's doing and telling you to go to the exact spot. Sometimes it's little nudges in our lives. Sometimes it's a neighbor moves in next door or a conversation at work that goes slightly spiritual and you feel a nudging. Maybe you should mention your own faith and you don't know, should I shrink back or do I talk about my faith in Christ? It's the same thing. God is always working in our lives, pushing us, nudging us, sending us out. To share. You never know who needs to hear. God, if our God cares enough to find a punk rocker who's lost in alcoholism and drug abuse to redeem his life and bring him here, an Ethiopian eunuch on his way home in loneliness and confusion to send a man running 
and you can all tell your own stories. You never know what he's up to. You don't have to know. You just have to step out in obedience and trust him. Let's bow in prayer together. Our Father, we pause and acknowledge that you are the God of all grace. You are sovereign over all things. You are constantly at work drawing people to yourself. And somehow in your love and, and, and masterful plan, you want to use us to do that. Give us the courage to obey and follow where you lead, even if we don't understand, to step out in faith. Give us the love and the joy to share with those who desperately need it. We thank you for the gospel, which has transformed our hearts and is changing the world. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.